Hello and welcome. You're watching Nothing But The Truth. A book launched on Monday makes some startling, if not astonishing, claims about four top politicians. The four politicians are Atul Bihari Vajpayee, Sonia Gandhi, Lal Krishna Advani and Rahul Gandhi. The book is called India's Broken Tryst. Here it is. And the author is the well-known journalist and columnist Tavleen Singh. Today, she's my exclusive guest. Tavleen Singh, let's start with what you say about Atal Bihari Vajpayee. You write, and I quote, Vajpayee is remembered as the first Prime Minister who was not from the Congress to have lasted a full term and for being a good man, but for little else. Do you really mean you can't find anyone to put to his credit? I put the roads in. I talk about how we, uh, Vijay Malia's helicopter crashed and <clears throat> sorry, and we went to, uh, we took a road to a highway to Bangalore. So he is remembered for the highways. What else is there to remember him for? The nuclear tests? Yeah, well, you know, I yeah. don't know. It's not the first, first thing that comes to my mind, you know. Um, I agree that the nuclear tests were uh, an achievement of sorts because it brought the Pakistani bombs out of the closet. So, you know, maybe that was good. But, you know, I'm not into defense affairs and security. So it was not something that was the first thing on my mind. And don't forget, it's written very much in the first person. So in you fact, know, your main criticism of Vajpayee is an intriguing one. You say he was, and again, I'm quoting you, too Nehruvian in his political and economic ideas to change anything when he was prime minister. You yes. add, he seemed not even to notice how desperately change was needed. Yes. Do you really believe that's a fair comment? I think that's a very fair comment. I believe, and I write about this almost every week in my column, that we've been ruled by a mixture of colonialism and democratic feudalism ever since independence. I actually think that we've been more colonized since 1947 than we ever were before. And your charge is Vajpayee failed could to have change, change that? Yes, he could have. And he knew what needed to be changed. I'd interviewed him many times before he became prime minister, where he pointed out things like health care needing change, like schools needing to be changed. He himself was a poet. He was a learned man. And he did none of that when he became peer. What, what difference did you notice? I don't notice any. In fact, you say something very striking. You say, and I'm quoting again, when Vajpayee became prime minister, he forgot easily that he had once lived in poverty. No sooner did he move into the three houses on Racecourse Road that make up the Indian Prime Minister's residence, then he began to behave just like Congress Prime Ministers. Clearly, behaving like Congress Prime Ministers in your eyes is a serious insult. You don't approve of that. I don't approve of, you know, the whole book is about the Indian state having become the enemy of the people of India. I don't believe that we have been governed in a fully democratic way. And the reason why this book started was because during the 2014 election campaign, I kept hearing people say they wanted parivartan, they wanted change. I believe they wanted change right from the time they gave Rajiv Gandhi a chance, right from then. And nothing's changed. You've it's got a bureaucracy that is colonized. But explain this to me. When you accuse Vajpayee of behaving like a Congress prime minister, what is it that he did and what is it that he failed well, to do? Well, you know, the grandee style living in Latian's Delhi, the, uh, the ministers with their red lights. The, uh, these are colonial uh, people. I mean, the only thing that's different between them and, and the British who you adore is the color of their skin. So we may as well have the British back and the princes for that matter, if you consider that every and political Vajpai party... And Vajpayee had a chance to change all of that he, I and didn't. I think he certainly did. In fact, you know, you go one step further. You write that Vajpayee was in awe of the Nehru Gandhis. I want to quote you. Was it awe of the Nehru Gandhi dynasty that prevented him from doing more to rectify the Congress Party's abysmal failures in the social sector? And you answer your question with the following words. I think it was. Do you really believe that Atal Bihari Vajpayee was in awe of Nehru, Indira, Rajiv, Sonia? Nehru for sure, that he admitted to me in more than one interview. And I think or, that... Or no, but listen, or admired. There, there is all of them. He was, there is a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a description in the book of a, of a dinner I had with him, or drinks in Just One Singh's house, where there was Arun Shori and Advani and Arun Jaitley. And 
I said to him, I don't know what I was doing in this, uh, you know, this August gathering, but at one point I said, you can take her on. She doesn't even speak Hindi, Sonia Gandhi. Was not in politics then. And he said, no, all she needs to do is cover her head and do this, and they'll vote for her. And he, he was right, but he was certainly in awe to have said that. But, but just a moment. That is true because he realized that a daughter-in-law of the Gandhi family, given the mystique around the Gandhi family, has a lot of support and sympathy taking her on would be politically wrong. That may have been sensitive political tactics, but you've converted it into awe. Do you really believe Vajpayee was in awe of the Gandhis? Explain to me why he never did anything to find out who got the Bofors money. So, you know, should I say he was crooked to do that? Or should I say that he was in awe of the family and didn't want to go more than a particular point in trying to attack them? We know where the Bofors money went, to the, to the bank accounts of two of Sonia Gandhi's closest friends. He could have found out where, where, it, where the Quatrochis were. He didn't. And he didn't do it, you say, because he was in awe? Well, you know, either that or he had other reasons why he didn't want to pursue the case. In fact, in your book, there's a point where you actually accuse him of dancing attendance and fawning attention upon the Gandhis. And again, I want to quote you. After he became prime minister, he seemed never to miss a chance to be present when Sonia and her children gathered at the memorial sites on the Yamuna to remember some dead member of the family. And True. you add, there was too much courtesy and Sonia took full advantage. I believe this to be true or I wouldn't have written it. And wasn't he always there? And didn't she always sit there regally with her, with her children looking disdainfully down at him? What was the reason for him to go? Uh, Narendra Modi doesn't go. He doesn't pay obeisance at every grave of the, of the Gandhi. Because don't forget there are two things here. You can go to a, a prime minister if you want to, but then you must go to all. He didn't. He, he went only to, went to the Nehru yes, Gandhi Memorial. Absolutely. In other words, he behaved, even though he was prime minister and a non-congressman. Like a congress prime minister. In fact, like a congress fawning courtier. Yes, I believe he did. You have two conclusions about Atal Bihari Vajpayee. At least I recognize them and read them as conclusions. The first is Vajpayee's record in securing India against jihadi terrorism was unimpressive. What sure. takes you to that conclusion? Excuse me, I'm, a, I'm astonished that you should even ask me that question. Do you remember Kandahar? Do you remember uh, his, I mean, he did very well after Kargil war, and I think I credit him with that. But, you know, by then he'd lost, he was only a, a, an acting prime minister. But he really did nothing at all to even try to catch the people we released who went on to, to kill Daniel Pearl and to attack parliament? Think about it. Is that a shining record in fighting terrorism? In other words, he let India I down. Would have, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the sort of person, if I was in his place, the minute they cross the border into Pakistan, bring in the Air Force if you need to and get rid of those awful people we released. Did he lack the courage to do it? Or did he simply lack the strategic thinking? Or was it that he, at the end of the day, didn't believe this was the right response? Uh, well, you know, I think I quote KPS Gill uh, in the book because uh, he, he said about, to the me about the hijacking. He said that plane should never have left Amritsar. And I think that he left everything in the hands, especially these kind of things, in the hands of Brijesh Mus Misra, who was only a diplomat, who was not an expert in he these He chose things. the wrong man to handle security chose, issues. And he didn't build up. The, uh, the strength, the defense of India that should have been built up at that time. Your second conclusion, and it's the more sweeping conclusion, <clears throat> is the following sentence. As Prime Minister, he seemed to lose confidence in his own instincts as a politician and even in his extraordinary gift of oratory. This, this really disappointed me almost more than anything else. He was, he uh, remains to this day in my view, the best Indian orator India has ever had. Except when he was Prime Minister. Except when he was Prime Minister. When he got up the first time on the Red Fort, uh, when he made his first speech there, it was just dreary beyond belief. The only, and I mention this, I give him full credit for that, the only shining moment was Lahore, where he truly made a speech that came from his heart. And the official standing next to me, I'm not going to name him because it was, you know, I don't think that he gave me permission to quote him, 
said, thank God he's not reading the speech we wrote for But him. your book says that was the only occasion in six years as Prime that Minister. That was the only good speech he made as far as I can remember. I get the feeling that with regard to Atul Bihari Vajpayee, you're not just disappointed, you're disillusioned, almost to the point of feeling let down. Let down personally. Because I used to be a huge fan of Atalji, and in their bar, if you remember, I actually describe in great detail a speech that he made when they were released from jail after the emergency. So I was personally disappointed that he didn't do the things I'd hoped for. And let down. And let down, yes. Let's come to Sonia Gandhi. You say not only did she know nothing of Indian politics, but you actually go on to question whether she loved the country. Now, the first is understandable, at least in the initial period, because she wasn't born Indian. But the second, you're questioning whether she actually loves India. Can that really be raised because she's chosen consciously and deliberately to live her life in this country? Uh, I think that when you write a book of this kind, which is really a personal view of what happened, you have a right to your opinion. And you know, she really hurt me personally on more than one occasion. She nearly tried to get rid of me from the Indian Express and caused huge damage to people around me. So I'm entitled to feel really, you know, strongly about the kind of person she is. If she'd loved India, she'd have done a lot better than she did in the past 10 I'm years. I'm glad you said that she hurt you and I'm glad you said you are therefore entitled to write about her the way it's you have. It's a personal memoir. It's a personal memoir, I concede it. But you are an analyst, you are a journalist. And one of the things that surprises me is that not only do you question whether Sonia loves India, you actually go on to question her political understanding, not in 83 and 93 when she was a novice in politics, but in 2004 when she brought Congress for the first government back after many years of wilderness. Then she went on to repeat it for a second government. The and second remember, one, in my view, was Dr. Manmohan But remember, she's also served for 18 years and continuing as president of the Congress Party. And would any it's of... It's a private limited company, the except Congress that Party. Would she be so successful if the following sentence from your book is correct? And remember, that sentence refers to the year 2004. Her only political qualification was that she married into a certain family. Yes. I still believe that to be true. In the past 10 years, when India, she inherited a country that was booming economically, not thanks to her or any member of her family, but thanks to the reforms that were done to the economy under Narsimha Rao. The, the economy was then brought down into the toilet, literally, and we have to start again from scratch, even now, two years after she's gone. We're still trying to rebuild a broken economy. But you know, you're not just critical of Sonia, which you have every right to be, but you're dismissive and disparaging. I want to quote this. In all the years that she lived in Delhi as the Prime Minister's daughter-in-law and wife, I never once saw her show concern that could be described as social, except if this were to be used in the context of social secretaries and dinner parties. Ouch! That is really dismissive, right. disparaging, and even contemptuous. Okay, one minute. She lived here from the time that she was 18 years old. When did she do anything to, to help children, for instance, to help women, to do anything, to do even what the Mem Saabs in Delhi drawing rooms try to do, which is go to Mother Teresa's thing and, you know, sat, salve their consciences by by sort of helping a few children clean up or something. She never, what had she ever done in any way that indicates to you that she loves India so much that she would like to see it as a less poor country, that she would like to see India's children live better? What has she ever done? Name me one thing. You know, you Name me one thing that she's done other than enjoy a great deal of political power without any accountability. You were good enough to admit that there is hurt that she's caused you, and I imagine a lot of that hurt is showing through. In Darbar, your last book, you write about how you were very good friends once upon a time. When Not your very son good friends. I was on the outer edge of the inner circle. But when your son Atish was born, and I believe you were living in a she Basati, was very generous. she brought Rahul's old clothes for you. No, she brought new clothes from Italy for Atish. Even better. Yeah. That friendship has broken. How much of the comments that you make about her, the disparaging, dismissive remarks, are hurt and bitterness? Because when friendships break, they get replaced with bitterness. Is that the bitterness that's no, coming through? No, 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 no. I, it would be completely wrong to assume that. Because actually what I have criticized is her personality, 
her actions and her policies. In the beginning, before she be got elected, I, I was very upset that, uh, you know, that a foreigner should try to be Prime Minister of India. I gave that up as soon as she got elected. After that, all my criticism of her, including in this book, and she actually damaged me personally. Do an interview with Jayanti Natarajan and find out how she was ordered to close down Lavasa. Please Let me put do one. this to you. I said that disillusionment, even a sense of being betrayed, came through when you wrote about Vajpayee. When you write about Sonia, the impression I get is you simply dislike her. Uh, no, it really is about the fact that I would like to see India as a prosperous country in my lifetime. And we had a chance to start getting there. And Sonia didn't help. I think that Sonia, in the last three years or four years, when she was actually prime minister, in the first term, it was Dr. Manmohan Singh who was, and he did the, the 2009 election would never have been won okay. if it hadn't been for him. And now, what in the last three years, when she could she, have, you're saying she, she didn't. When she became prime minister, she ruined the economy. She created a political culture that was all about dynastic politics. Every, I think it's about 35% okay. of parliament, one minute, of parliament is, is filled with young MPs who are heirs. You've turned Parliament House into a Delhi drawing room, you know? I mean, The BJP me, has airs as well, but I don't want to get stuck on that point. It started, as I say in the book, with if Sanjay and Rajiv Gandhi had not been brought in by Indira Gandhi, nobody else would have dared. Let's move on to two other politicians you write about and about whom you write not just striking and startling things, but astonishing things. First, about Lal Krishna Advani during the 2009 election campaign when he was the BJP's, prime ministerial candidate, you say, and I'm quoting you, he looked like a pathetic old man trying to look young. That's not only untrue, it's cruel. He, he was, I'm speaking about in a particular context, which you're not saying here naughtily. He was in a gym and trying to lift weights. And that is what I'm describing. And he did look really pathetic to try and do that. I mean, he's not known as a great athlete or someone who's always running around or going to the gyms. And there he was lifting weights. Do you remember the picture? It appeared in all the newspapers. That's what I'm talking about specifically. Of Rahul Gandhi during the UP campaign of 2012, you write the following. His inability to speak or understand Hindi well enough to communicate with people who only speak this language caused much mirth and confusion. I have to say, you're the first person who's ever said or claimed or written that Hindi? Rahul Gandhi can't speak Hindi. That's another matter. But you're the first person who's ever said that Rahul Gandhi and can't give, speak or understand Hindi. I, his Hindi is really bad. It's, uh, it, it, he should have learnt it by now, and he hasn't. And I'm speaking again in a specific context. There is a, a, a Mahavara in Hindi which says, Barsat ki menda khome. And that means that it's, it's, a, it's a creature that only comes out when the rain comes. And Priyanka used it, her Hindi is very good, used it when she went back to Amethi and they said, you know, you don't come in between. And she said, and somebody asked this poor man about this and he said, Okay? Perhaps now, he was that, joking. It, it, Perhaps no, he was joking. I'm sorry, I watched it in detail more than once before I wrote this, and I feel really sorry for him that even something as simple as that Mohavra didn't, you know, didn't sort of make him understand what she was trying to say. And if you think his Hindi is good, you must be the only person in the world who does. Because you ask anybody, the reason why he lost in UP was he was up against a young prince, again, from the state of UP, who spoke a language people could understand. All right, let's pull back. I've talked about the four key politicians who I mentioned in the introduction, about whom you've written startling, if not astonishing things. We've been through each and every one of them. In the last four or five minutes left, I want to give and talk about an overview of your book. As I read the book, I said to myself, this is a collection of anecdotes and stories, each of which has really no connection with the other. I mean, as I noticed, your book jumps from Sonia Gandhi to street children in Mumbai, from Lavasa to Jawar Nehru, from child prostitutes to Vajpayee, from your dog, question. Miss Mooley, yeah. to corruption. Okay. And I said to myself, 
What does all of this add up to? I don't India's, have the answer. Well, man, what up. does it add up to? I'm, give me a chance. India's broken tryst with the people of India. The whole point of the book, the whole, every anecdote, is to try and explain how whether they are street children in, in Bombay, whether it's Ajit, whether it's me, whether the, 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 the Indian state has, in my view, become the enemy of the people. And I find that very dangerous. And I feel very strongly, as I told you before, about the fact that we haven't decolonized governance. And I'm really hoping that this prime minister does that. Can I put this to you? There is an attempt made in the epilogue, the very last 10, 12 pages of the book, to put across this thought that connects to the title. It's on the first flap of the book What's, as well. well, maybe. The flap and the epilogue. The but the actual content, but the in, actual it's content, in the, it's in the, no, well, this is don't it. link the different anecdotes and reflections and stories together. You don't produce a theme. You don't produce a moral Read or a lesson. Read it again more carefully. I do. Everywhere I point out, when I talk about the school system not being uh, good enough, when I talk about health care not being good enough, when I talk about the condition of our cities, everywhere I point out that it's this, this, uh, this commitment to make that tryst with destiny in which all our leaders have failed. And I use the, the anecdotes, because it's very boring to read about just politicians and what they're saying, and I don't like to read that way. So I like to write in a way that people will read the book. I understand that, and it's a very readable book. Each of those anecdotes, each of those chapters is a very readable chapter. And the problem each is, of them no, reflect let me finish. a broken truth. Well, the problem is that as you read a very readable story, you say to yourself at the end of it, why is she making me read this? Because the thought that connects them, the line of theme or reasoning that should read pull the them title together is missing. Read the, book. read the title. Only India's the title broken. and the epilogue. In no, but one minute, the missing. title is very, very important. I'm talking about every anecdote in the book is about that broken tryst. Let me put it like this. I know the title raises certain expectations. I know right at the end, the epilogue tries very hard to try and justify the title. In between are some 200 and more pages. And when I read those, I said to myself, maybe this book should be called Assorted Memories from My Lifetime. Or, if you permit me to be unkind, maybe the book should oh, be called. You've already been unkind. Maybe the Read book should the be book called. Again, more maybe, carefully. maybe the book should be called minute, a bit you, of this uh, and a bit of that. Karan, you missed the point when you read Darbar. You saw it. You said to me, I remember very clearly. You said if you hadn't put in those few pages about Sonia, then it's a good book. The whole point of that book was about a country exploding with problems like in Punjab and Kashmir, and a useless, effete group of people trying to rule from Delhi. This book is about the people of India being betrayed by its rulers, which is why you have the stories of the people with the stories of the leaders through it. So read it can again. I, can, I, can I make a distinction between the chapters in this book and the columns you write every Sunday for the Indian Express? Those columns often begin anecdotally, but they always go on for the last 50% or at least the last 30% to draw lessons out of the anecdote you've begun with. Here, that lesson drawing, Read it those again. themes, those linkages are missing, except when you come to the epilogue. I, my feeling you was... You haven't read it well enough. You I haven't read, read it like word you read the, for word. You read, I'm sorry you read the bar wrongly. You didn't understand that book. I'm sorry you haven't understood this. Read it again is what I say to you, okay? Next time, read it again and do another interview with me to promote the book. I would have just said one thing that the very readable storytelling of Tavleen Singh is exhibited in this book to perfection. It's one of the most readable books I've come across in a long well, time. Well, thank you. However, the analytical side of Tavleen Singh is missing. I don't agree with you at all. Storytelling rather than analyzing is no, what this book No, no, you missed it in the bar. I had to keep telling you it's about the, a country exploding everywhere with problems and this effete group of people at the top. This book started with, the, with I couldn't understand why Parivartan had so much resonance in the last election. And so I used that to find out why. And every anecdote is about the betrayal of the people of India by her leaders. All right, Talit Singh, let's leave it there. A pleasure talking to you. Thank you.